Hi, my name is Dr. Kim Van Orden, and I'm a clinical psychologist and associate professor at the University of Rochester. I'm going to talk to you today about some strategies that my colleagues and I have developed that may be useful for you so that you can stay connected with others during COVID-19 and the need for physical distancing. I direct the HOPE Lab at the U of R. That stands for helping older people engage. My students, colleagues, and I work together to learn about strategies we can all use to maintain and increase well being as we grow older. We study ways to maintain and grow meaningful social connections in later life. People around the world are living longer, and the number of older adults worldwide is on the rise. Growing older is a journey more and more of us will have the privilege of experiencing. For many people, growing older allows them to gain increased perspective on life and develop increased relationship satisfaction. However, those positive experiences don't develop for all of us due to a diverse range of challenges. Members of my lab study psychosocial challenges some older adults face as they grow older. Things like physical illness or difficulty with mobility that may make it harder to get outside the home or losses of loved ones that can change our social worlds. And even if you don't identify as an older adult, as we all navigate physical distancing during COVID-19, some of the challenges that become more common in later life will become more common for all of us. Have you been struggling to find ways to feel connected with others during these challenging times? I'm guessing that you might be, because most of us are, although in different ways. I want to share with you some of the things my colleagues, students, and I have learned about ways to promote social connections and well-being in spite of the challenges that may make it harder to connect. In particular, I'm going to walk you through the steps of creating a connections plan to help you stay healthy in all areas of your life, your social, mental, and physical health. With all the stress that we're facing right now, why would you want to prioritize your social health? Well, lots of research has shown us that social connections are essential for health and well being at all ages. When we feel isolated or lonely, our quality of life suffers. And that may show up for us as sadness or depression or even thoughts of suicide. When we feel isolated and lonely, we're also more likely to engage in unhealthy behaviors like smoking, eating an unhealthy diet, or skipping exercise. We're also more likely to experience poor physical health, like heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, pain, fatigue, and insomnia. People who feel isolated and lonely also don't live as long as people who have meaningful social relationships. Perhaps most compelling during COVID-19 is that feeling isolated and lonely is associated with impaired immune functioning, which could make someone more vulnerable to coronavirus infection and complications. Making your social health a priority is important because it makes life more meaningful, but also because your social health impacts your physical health. However, creating a connections plan isn't as simple as just jotting a few ideas down on a piece of paper. Why not? Because sometimes prioritizing our social health is hard. I just finished reading a fantastic audiobook by Jessica Pan titled, Sorry I'm Late, I Didn't Want to Come. Can you relate to that title? One barrier to prioritizing our social health is that reaching out, especially reaching out in new ways, can create anxiety and it takes effort. Other barriers show up in the ways we talk to ourselves, our thoughts or self-talk. The barriers are different for all of us, but there are some common parts too. I'm going to help you figure out what your barriers are. First up though, what do we mean by social connections? An important point to keep in mind is that humans are social creatures. Just like we have a need for air and food and water and shelter, we need other people for safety and for comfort. We have a need to belong. When we have an unmet need to belong, that can happen for several reasons. One is that we're isolated from other people, and that's termed social isolation in the figure that you can see there. If we're isolated from other people, maybe by living alone, not being able to leave the house, or being able to talk to friends and family, or by going to groups that you might enjoy, like church or a sports group, social relationships also give us things we need, like information, assistance with daily tasks, like getting groceries and, and emotional support. We think of these things as different types of social support. If you're worried you won't have someone to help you if you're sick, 
or getting to the doctor, or if you don't help, have help with chores, you might be experiencing difficulties with social support. And that can make us feel like we don't belong or like we're alone, and that can be scary. Another way a lack of connections may show up for us is feeling lonely. This can happen even if we're around other people, and it can be especially painful when we feel lonely or like we don't belong when we are with other people. The experience of feeling connected and cared about is just as important to our health as actually being connected, like spending time with people or having support. All of these types of connections are important. So the first part of creating your connections plan is to think about which type of connections you want to work on. So think about those three up there, social support or isolation or loneliness, and which one do you want to prioritize right now? The next step in creating your connections plan is to figure out what's getting in the way of feeling connected. Now, before you roll your eyes and say, Kim, it's COVID, that's my barrier, hang in there with me because it's a little more complicated than that. When I work with my patients in my psychotherapy practice, and when I want to help myself too, I use a set of principles from Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, or CBT for short. We can use CBT to help us with isolation and loneliness, just like we use it to help with depression and anxiety and other mental health problems. By using the CBT model to understand your experience of isolation and loneliness, I hope that you'll be able to feel more in control of this stressful experience, and also that you'll know how to pick the best strategy for you to feel more connected. CBT teaches us that our emotional experiences, including loneliness and feeling stressed from being isolated, are caused by not just our objective circumstances like COVID-19, but also by our thoughts, our physical sensations in our body, and our actions, or what we do. This is good news, and let me tell you why. Right now, I can't stop the COVID pandemic, and right now, you can't either. But right now, in this moment, you and I can talk back to our thoughts. We can change the physical sensations in our body, and we can change our actions. That means we can change our emotional experience of loneliness and stress. So let's break that down a bit. How we think about an event or a circumstance or a stressful experience, meaning the perspective we have on it, really impacts how we feel about it. Think about that for a moment. During COVID-19, do you feel scared one day, sad the next, or sometimes guilty? Or maybe all of those at different times during the same day even? Do you sometimes watch the same news clip with your spouse or friend and have a completely different emotional reaction? Like you feel really angry and he feels afraid. Those are examples of how having different perspectives or interpretations of an event influence how we feel. Take a look at this exercise. Imagine that you're talking with three friends on a video call and you are discussing the latest news clip where there was an announcement about another month of physical distancing. Everyone goes around and shares how they're feeling. Your first friend says, what if I get sick and there's no one to help me? How might she feel? Maybe sad, guilty, or afraid? Probably afraid, right? But now your next friend says, I'm a burden on my son with everything else he's dealing with. How do you think that person would feel? Guilty, afraid, sad? If you put that thought in your head, you probably realize that person would likely feel guilty. And what about another friend? That friend says, no one cares about me. How would that person feel? Probably sadness, right? So imagine now it's your turn and you share how you're feeling and you say, you know what? I'm actually kind of glad that they're putting that extra month in place because I'm hoping it will keep all of us safe. How do you think you might be feeling? Maybe relieved or calm. So, Let's break down what all of that means. Do you see how our thoughts are an important cause of how we feel? That's worth repeating. Thoughts cause feelings. They're that powerful. If you wanna figure out what you're thinking, here's something to try. When you notice a strong feeling like fear or sadness, pause for a moment and ask yourself, what just went through my mind? Or what was I telling myself just now? And jot down what comes to mind. This is important because when you know what you're thinking, 
you can decide if you want to believe it or not. And if you don't, you can talk back to that thought and change how you're feeling. Of course, finding helpful self-talk can be tricky, so here are some tips. When you notice thoughts that make you feel bad, like angry or scared or sad, you can ask yourself a few questions, like, how can I view the situation from a different perspective? Or you can think about someone you know who's optimistic and who you value their perspective. How would that person think about this situation? And if you talk back to an unhelpful thought and that thought comes back in your mind again later, remind yourself, I don't have to believe everything I think. We all need reminders of this. I even have that quote as a bumper sticker on my car. Don't believe everything you think because I need to remind myself of that all the time. And if a thought keeps popping up and you're not sure how to talk back to it, you can also try a brief exercise called examining the evidence. To do this, grab a piece of paper and write down your thought, for example, no one cares about me, and list the evidence in support of that thought on one side of the paper and the evidence that contradicts that thought on the other side. Then imagine you're an attorney and see which argument wins the case. A final way to manage thoughts that make us feel isolated and lonely, and which may be especially helpful during COVID-19, is to change thoughts by using mindfulness. Engaging in a mindfulness activity or prayer can connect us with a sense of our shared humanity and that we're all in this together. I listed some resources for learning or practicing mindfulness that you may want to check out on that table in the middle. Sometimes it can be challenging to identify or talk back to thoughts if our emotions are really strong because it can be hard to think straight. In that case, it can be helpful to change our body's physiology. Emotions are also referred to as feelings because we literally feel our emotions in our bodies. One way to change emotions is to change our body sensations. That's the second piece in the CBT model. In particular, human touch may be something you're missing if you live alone right now. Human touch has a powerful effect on our body's physiology. It makes us feel safe and comforted. However, that doesn't mean you can't make your body and mind feel safe and comforted if you live alone. You just may need to find replacements for now. I know that's hard, but here are some suggestions. Relaxation and imagery exercises or prayer or meditation can help you slow your breathing and calm you. You can soothe your five senses with music, good smells, petting your dog or cat, looking at art or something beautiful, or sipping tea. Doing these things with the intention to soothe or comfort yourself makes them even more powerful. Finally, if your emotions are particularly strong, you can change your body chemistry with temperature. Splashing cold water on your face or taking a hot bath can be pretty powerful. Sometimes it can be helpful to plan one of these activities before you try something more challenging, like talking back to thoughts or changing our actions, which we'll turn to now. We have to get creative in finding ways to connect these days. A particularly powerful way to feel more connected is to help others. Relationships are especially likely to help us feel like we belong when we're able to help others. There are lots of resources available to volunteer in safe ways that maintain physical distancing, including by sending letters to older adults in nursing homes, calling a friend who's feeling down, or sewing masks for your neighbors. And don't forget taking care of your pet. Trying out new ways of connecting virtually can also be helpful, like joining online classes or hosting a meetup with friends through a video call. Finally, take time every day to do something that reminds you of your connection with nature, a higher power, or a shared humanity. Again, do these things with the intention of fostering a sense of connection. Get some fresh air, make art, listen to music, watch birds or look at flowers. While you're doing that, remember, we're all in this together. Now that we've talked about the three parts of the CBT model, you can use that to develop a connections plan for when you feel isolated or lonely. Take a minute to write down some ways that you can change your thoughts or your perspective, some ways that you can change how your body feels, and new ways to connect in safe ways. It's best to do this ahead of time when you're feeling calm and connected, if you can, and then pull out your plan when you're feeling lonely or sad or scared. And you can always update this plan if you notice new negative thoughts or your circumstances change. 
I hope that creating this plan can help you stay connected and also remember that you have a role to play in your experience, even when it feels like you have no control. I have a quote from Mother Teresa on my wall in my office, and it says, if we have no peace, it is because we have forgotten that we belong to each other. From all of us in the Hope Lab, it is our hope that this time of stress and distance will also be an opportunity for all of us to remember how important it is to stay connected and to remember that going forward. <laughs>